you have a term sheet or would you like me to give you a term sheet? That's how you ask, are they investing or not? And as I said, very nice and pantry the first time and it cost me a fortune in coffee, a bit more ruthless because you don't want tire kickers and you're wasting their time as well. So real simple. The only advice I would give would be not to not to buy the company too low. I think that's a lot what a lot of us tend to do at the beginning. Um, we need the money. So we value the company lower than we should. So talk to others who have been through the journey to try not to make that mistake. Hello everyone. I'm Sinead Crowley, one of the founders, alongside Mary Carty and Claire McGee and Mary McKenna. Awaken Hub is not an events organisation. It's a community committed to raising each other up. So to be involved is to set yourself apart as an ally with the desire to change the landscape for women founders across the island of Ireland and indeed its diaspora. As I know, we have friends from the US, St. Marianne, uh, France um, and England online with us this evening. First up is Karina Kelly, who recently launched her second startup, Content Llama, and she'll be talking with Gillian Doyle about Cerebron's recent raise of 1.6 million euro for her insolvency tech company. And now I'm going to hand over to Karina and Gillian. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Karina from Content Llama, and I'm talking to you today from just outside Donegal Town. And I'm delighted to be asking loads of interesting questions uh, to Gillian of Cerebron, um, who, congratulations, Gillian, on your recent raise of 1.6 million. Um, I've known Gillian now for about just over a year, and she's been really helpful to me because I'm a little bit behind her in my fundraising and entrepreneurial journey. So I kind of look ahead to what Gillian's doing to know what I need to do next. So I'm really excited to be asking her some questions today um, and to share this all with you. So maybe to start, Gillian, I mean, I know about your business, but if you could just give us a brief background about Cerebron and in particular, your own entrepreneurial journey. Um, how you started from idea to raising 1.6 million in the last few months. So good evening, everybody. Um, it's lovely to see actually faces on screen as opposed to usually just the blank name. And then, especially if it's you're using your kid's tag name as well, that sometimes comes up on the Zoom. But thanks so much for putting on the videos. So I'm Gillian. Um, the company's called Cerebrin. And myself and my husband co-founded it about four years ago. And I would say probably in the last two years is when we've really <clears throat> gone at this in earnest. Uh, the whole point of the company is to basically prevent people from becoming insolvent, so consumers becoming insolvent, and in the case that they are, to make sure that they exit the debt successfully. Um, it's a very paper-heavy industry. We're an Irish company. We trade only into the UK at the moment, um, and we're a team of 11. And I guess, where did we start off with? Uh, so I worked in the industry for quite a long time and realized that automation and data were the drivers for the industry and to be able to provide tech, not only to the big corporates, but to everybody so that they could actually scale and grow. And a lot of money is being wasted on kind of paper processing. So we started and the first thing I did was we went into our local enterprise office, paid 100 euro um, to work out how to write a business plan um, because that is how little experience I had. Lived all the time in the UK, didn't even know what PAYE or PRSI was. <clears throat> and so just to kind of get us up and going, that was where we started. From there, we went into New Frontiers, um, and I think they gave us 15,000 was the first uh, to live on, basically, while we validated our idea. And pretty rapidly after that, then, we applied for the Competitive Start Fund. So we applied for the general entry one. Um, I was a big believer in, I'm going to be given up, and because it was myself and my husband, we're giving up the salaries, the life, everything like that to this. And I wanted to know, was it just good enough? Um, not because I was based in Donegal, not because it was fintech, and not because I have a different genetics to my husband. So for me, that was really, really important. Um, and after we did, we got the CSF, we had, um, I guess it was an uh, angel investor came in for 50,000 as well. And he was absolutely incredible because as you know, it's a real whirlwind to work out how do you ask for money? I think like 
Nobody likes asking for money. I didn't like asking my parents when I was a kid for pocket money. So that, that feeling hasn't gone away at all and how you get yourself ready to raise and to look for investment. Um, we did the NDRC program so, and we won a couple of awards on the way. So all of that kind of kept the cash flow going. Um, but as Karina said, uh, in March we closed. It was two, two parts of a seed round. We did one just before Christmas in 2018 and then we closed the second one there in March just gone. It's a big mixture, so it's a lot of angels made up with a couple of VCs and then some government funding as well. So really happy to chat through where you can ask away at anything about the different types involved. But that's where we've got to. And I think one of the biggest things for me is you're always running out of money. So I look at the first week of when we close it and go, isn't that great? We have loads of money. And now I don't have to worry about that for this week. But then the minute that week is over, you're back to worrying about money again. <laughs> I know, I know. And when you look back, Gillian, so even if you take the last two years, so New Frontiers, NGRC, CSF, Into Angels and Seed Rays, what are the three things that you did, think you did really well? And maybe the three things that you think, God, I wish somebody had told me that, or that you would do differently with your next venture, which I'm sure there will be over the years. Um, I think uh, I'll start, there's always millions of things that everybody does wrong. I think uh, for us, focusing on the right part of the product, we went for the big, huge build. Um, it was enterprise sales, um, very difficult sales process. Mm. And that was a challenge. We, were, we should have gone for something that was more snackable at the beginning. I think that can be easily consumed. We definitely had, like we did good proof of principle, um, the, one of the best things we did do was our market research. So I knew the industry um, and my immediate target market, like that laser focus. But the one thing I didn't know was how do I sell into a tier one bank? What does the company need to look like to be able to achieve huge enterprise sales, big ticket names on, the back, on your books? Mm -hmm. And I think that an understanding that I needed to do that was really important because it did dictate the strategy of the business. Um, we've managed COVID has upset things we've managed our investors I think pretty well um, we were very prepared going out to raise um, learned fast adapted harder and um, I think one of the big things is the prep I will go into detail about it but to get yourself investor ready and for managing that where we were terrible was managing the closing um, we allowed far too many legal teams to come in um, and the second time around we did it, I was ruthless is the only way to describe it um, because it just costs so much money. Um, and I think for us, probably one of the better things that we did do um, and we continue to do is we've really great relationships with our investors because you can either perceive them to add value to your company or to just be money. Um, yeah. And the only way you can get them to add value is to bring them on the journey. And they're usually super busy themselves. So it's about yeah. minimizing the interruption for them and maximizing the output for yourself. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. And when you get them there, which you have, and you said you've got a mix of, you know, <clears throat> VCs and angels and, you know, I'm a salesperson and I like the fundraising thing, which I kind of enjoy because it's just sales but it's, it's a customer decision-making cycle. So as with um, customers, there's different types of customers. They decide things differently. They need different information to get them over the line. And the little experience I've had with VCs who we don't have on board yet and angels is that they're two totally different kettles of fish when it comes to A, getting them interested and B, getting them through the process and bringing them on the journey with you. So what have you learned to be the key differences? You know, if I was to go into a room tomorrow, uh, one room had angels and one room had VCs, what's the key things, even, you know, um, how we talk to them, um, what kind of comms they like, communications they like, what do they expect from me if I was to walk into each of those rooms? What's different between the two? Definitely. So if you take a standard VC, um, and usually they get a big bad wolf name, right? And they're not at all, they're all humans like the rest of us. And... Mm -hmm. They have metrics that they have to live by. And if you're raising money, you need to understand their metrics. So they expect three out of 10 to do companies to do very well and seven to fail. 
So what are those metrics that determine that? And you need to be ready to defend your business against their metrics. That's the big part of it. At the end of the day, you're right, Karina, it is a complete customer-based transaction. You have to build a relationship. They have to buy into your story. And when it's early seed, like you might as well set fire to your financials because they're that accurate in what's going to happen, right? And every VC knows this. Every angel knows this. Um, all your product timelines, multiply it by three. Like These are all things that everybody knows. So the real difference is they're actually backing you. So that the idea and the business idea is the model is right. It's a model they're familiar with. So a business type model. You need to be very clear. Are you enterprise? Are you SaaS? Are you what type of sales process it is? Yeah. But it's down really to you yourself. So is the founding team the right one to be able to deliver the business? I think for me, that's the biggest part of when we had very little traction and I think that's why we got backing was they believed in myself and Ken to do it. Yeah. Um, that's definitely one way. The angels are different as well. So an angel will jump in much easier. Um, and I, I, this is general broad brush stuff, right? So there's always exceptions to the rules. But in general, an angel will find comfort if they know that a VC is coming in onto the mm -hmm. um cap table or they know enterprise ireland is coming in on the cap table there's something to de-risk their money um but i would say like you know people always say how do you find angels you will probably know quite a few high net worth individuals in who are used to doing this and the way you start the conversation and it's an easier one is i'm thinking about going out raising money can you give me some advice here's my deck here's my thing what do you think would you consider investing and that's a lot easier to have that conversation. Then there is the H-band, so in Ireland, and they definitely have a network in the UK um, that's very similar. You can register with H-band, and basically they'll pre-screen you. And then you go to angel events all around the country, and you pitch, and anybody who's interested, it's always about getting a second date. So you go in to try and get you have this general group date and then you need to get your second individual date mm -hmm. um, and you'll find very quickly if they're jarring you about the business they're interested my general opinion is when they talk an awful lot about themselves as opposed to grilling you at the very beginning you know you're going to be about seven or eight cup of coffees before it's a no yeah. right so it's about minimizing that amount of time and really be firm and say to them, they understand, you know, these are very successful individuals. I need time. I need to know if this is something that you're very interested in and, you know, can we move it along? Yeah. And it's very hard to say, but it does. Otherwise, you can have so much coffee, you might as well buy shares in Nescafe um, and it tends to go on. Whereas the journey with the VC is different. You'll usually go in the door. And I would say if you're looking to raise at the moment and you think you're about six months time, you'll be ready to go, start contacting VCs now. Now is the time to start building that relationship and get talking to them, explain your business. You'll go through different levels depending on the size of the VC. So sometimes there's like what I would call a filter person that will say yes or no, and then they'll move you up to the partner. Yeah. you'll pitch to the partner team and then there'll be different people in the business that'll go through for instance your financial due diligence your commercial due diligence technical due diligence all of that has to happen um and as you go through the process every time you see a step you're one step closer to getting there um but again it is always about managing that relationship and really getting to know them because you can take angels on for money or vcs on for money but for me our best ones have been the ones that add value to us. And we have a super group. I'm able to email them with any problem I have um, and ask them what, what would they do. Okay. And, you know, on that, when say you're doing that whole, okay, I have done it at a very small level. We had a few angels that were interested and we were doing the chats and all that. Um, I was reading an article and I was saying how you have to create this kind of, you know, fear of moving out, fear of moving out, yeah. of losing out. So you want them to want you and they want to be, you know, go steady with you as opposed to just have a couple of dates. 
how do you create that buzz and have the confidence to do that, especially in the beginning? I know second time around now after having it done the first time, I know a little bit more, but have you any tricks in terms of when you're talking to VCs and angels, like any little psychological things that you drop into conversation to make them think, ooh, this is something now, there's something happening here um, that I don't want to miss out on? Yeah, I mean, the cap of the money that you're going to raise. So first off, whatever you think you need to double it um, is uh, for me, you know, and particularly females uh, tend to ask for a lot less than they need. Um, particularly the time period that we're in, you know, sales are slower. Um, and so definitely look at your runway. You need a minimum of 18 months is what you should be looking for in your in your first round. Um to generate, though, that FOMO, as you say, the way we did it was we set the amount we originally were looking to raise lower. And then we had people, a lot of people looking to fill. And so it was able to corral them very quickly going, well, no, we're already tapped out. So if you want in, I need to know. And then we extended it slightly. So we okay. put a virtual level. It's like your virtual zero in your business. You know, what is real zero versus and so for us we would have set I think we had 600 was the first part of the round 600,000 and we then opened it up to I think it was 850 um and closed it at that knowing that this this was how we were going to do it and it also gives you the opportunity to drive momentum so to get it signed and get it closed but I will say be very very aware when you're closing around um from the minute you get your term sheet agreed there's still about two to three months before the money will be in the account because it takes so much time to close the actual investment. And the big thing there for me, it's you have to look at the calendar year. So when you're talking about high net worth individuals, they're probably at a stage of their life where they can head off for the summer for two months and don't give a hoot about your 20 grand that they're giving you. Right, they'll look at it and go, Oh, sure, I'll do it in September. It's yeah. not their fault, it's just the reality of it. The same at Christmas. And if you've UK angels coming in versus Irish, they're end of year tax. So, are they June end of year? Are they April end of year people? Because they will have a portfolio that they'll invest for the year. And if you're on the wrong side of that, that will be a yes or a no as well. So, just it's the same as your buyer's cycle and your budgeting. It's the very same with um, angels and with VCs. And a way to spot, you need to find out, does a VC have money? Because you could be trotting all over the world talking to VCs. <clears throat> you need to ask the question, do they have money? Are they investing in seed companies like mine at the beginning? Because there's no point in having 10 conversations and realizing at the end they don't have the cash to be able to do it. Um, and also, I would, my big thing was we spoke to quite a few companies that our VCs had invested in um, to be able to work out what they were like to work with, um, what the future is going to hold, because everybody gets upset about the equity they're giving away. The minute you have any investor, you no longer have the company. It's not yours. And you might as well get rid of that virtual notion. You do have power, but there's somebody else that has put money in that is now that you're now responsible to you know so equity is always i think it's a big one people get really precious about but a big part of a pie that's worth a lot less you know it's a lot worse than a small part of a pie that's worth a lot more so you know with equity do you think about when you're giving it away or you're giving away a convertible loan note all the terms that are in your investment documents means and it's this 51 percent control you don't have control anymore you have shareholder agreements and you have investor clauses that you are responsible to. Okay. Uh, have I time for one more very quick one? Cause I need to know the answer to this. How, right. It's all, you know, fundraising the first time was great crack uh, back when we came out of NDRC because I know customers. So it's fabulous. You know, you can spend yeah. all day. Doing it. Now what do I do? So I need to go into a raise now. I've, I come into the office during the day. I'm on Zooms all day long. You know, there's actual real customers. And outside of weekend working or whatever, do you have any tips during the week on how to put the, this into your weekly schedule? Do you, what do you do? Do you have certain hours or certain days? Or Yeah. So I won't talk to a customer. 
Thursday is my technical day, so I just call it technical Thursday. Okay. Because I'm responsible for data, for me, that is the day. And you need blocks of time to yeah. be able to look at what's going on and how are things going. Because if the product's not brilliant, you're never going to be able to sell it to the next person. Um, in terms of investors, when you're in the thick of it, three days of your week is going to be tied up because they're only available during those hours. Yeah. You do have to delegate a lot of the customer stuff. If you're running the investment, then that's what you're doing and that's what your priority is. Mm -hmm. The big thing I would say, though, is most investors are going to ask you for the same set of things. So have it ready, have it in a drop box so that the information is the same no matter who you give it to. Okay. You need a one pager, a two pager. Then you need to have a pitch deck that you present with, but you need a detailed pitch deck. Your business plan, and then you split out all the chapters of your business plan and brand the top of them. So some VCs will look for more marketing information. Some will look for a bit more of this detailed financials. Because that's the big thing that you get caught up in, Karina, is trying to respond to their request for information. Okay. Um, and for me, if you can manage that from the very beginning, it takes a lot less of your time. Fab. Okay. Sorry, Gillian, I'm going to cut across you. Yeah, no, that's all. Cool. We've been told to wrap up. Um, that was amazing. So I've been scribbling down here, taking notes the whole way through. Um, I've learned a lot um, in those 20 minutes. So thank you. Um, we're going to come back afterwards for another couple of questions. And I think Mary's going to open the floor for some questions then that came in. So um, moving on to our second um, session, which the time is just flying by, um, I want to welcome in Larissa Feeney, um, who's a founder of Accountant Online, an award-winning um, accountancy online accountancy firm. And um, Larissa has a couple of questions for Karina and for Gillian. And I think you have then questions for each other. And then after that, Mary McKenna is going to come in with some of the Eventbrite questions that were submitted and any um, questions that have popped up in chat as we go along. Okay, um, thanks everyone. And over to you, Larissa. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Hi, everybody. As Sinead said, my name is Larissa. I'm from Accountant Online. Thanks, Karina and Gillian. That was a really informative session. Um, and I just have a couple of questions, actually, just to follow on from what you guys were talking about. Um, Gillian, if I can start with you. I'm just wondering, when we start when we start a business, and especially when we try to scale um, and hope to raise investment, we hear a lot about company structure and how we should structure our company. Considering your operation across multiple jurisdictions, um, UK and ROI, how did you decide what was the best structure for you and where did you f find was the best place to look for advice? Um, yeah, so we obviously we have Enterprise Ireland funding. So we decided and we wanted to keep, that was one of the big things uh, for us was having the business in Ireland. So our parent company, is based in Ireland and we have a UK branch. And the reason why we have a UK branch is so that we can access investment from the UK that where the angel investors can get their SEIS, SES relief from. So that's really important. You can't do that with a subsidiary. Now we do have a UK subsidiary and we have our sales staff and our revenue comes into the subsidiary. But for us um, and for investors, if you're dealing with Irish investors, they want to be able to see that the um, intellectual property is protected. And that's why we structured our company in that manner, that the head office owns or the parent company owns basically the intellectual property. That's where the investment goes in. And then it makes it easier as we scale into Europe to be able to open up subsidiaries outside of um, Ireland and run the sales through that but all the time the IP is being retained then by the parent company. So if anything goes wrong and we have to shut a subsidiary down, it doesn't impact then on the valuation of the company overall. Mm -hmm. Where did I get advice from? Um, I went around and dated lots of the top five um, advisors, corporate advisors. We went in, told them we were a startup and I didn't pay for any of it. I went in and said, these are my problems. What do you think? Um, and trotted around London for a couple of days, literally pulling up advice. We spoke to our investors um, 
investors don't mind having to change your group structure and things like that as long as all the investment rights that you sign up to at the beginning are retained in any of the new structures. Um, so once you can provide that degree of protection with them, they're usually very, very easy to work with. And it is, it's always about growth. But I did shamelessly went and got lots of advice and didn't pay for any of it. Um, so yeah. Okay, good woman. That's, that's, the, that's the way to do it. And you mentioned growth there so you're obviously on a growth path now um how do you create that culture within the team a culture of growth and innovation um i think transparency for me is key um and focus i guess when the lockdown happened we um changed tact on a product but to get everybody on board and why we were doing this and why it's so important i think bringing everybody in to talk about that everybody says they want a lot of autonomy in their jobs sometimes they don't sometimes they just want to be told what to do um, and I think you know it is completely person dependent for us innovation to me comes from different methods of thought there's a lot about diversity um, in terms of cultures but actually it's about having different people with different ways of thinking on teams so we have a very technical team but we have somebody who's commercial that actually drives product so that there's a different way and a different behavior and a different attitude. Um, but yet it's, it's very transparent, the culture in the company. If you have a problem, you say it and, you know, things get dealt with very, very quick. But trust, it does come down to trust. And like anything in life, trust does take time to build. Um, and especially their trust in us as, as leaders. And Gillian, where is the team based? Are you all based in Donegal? No, we're all over the place. Uh, we've some in Dub uh, Dublin, uh, Birmingham, uh, South Africa, and Donegal. Then predominantly Donegal, and then I tend to be a transient. So um, before lockdown, I don't think I'd been in my home for more than five days in the last couple of years. So yeah all over the place so it's a it's a very remote team um and we do a huge amount to try and drive engagement within the company on a day-to-day -day basis okay okay very good thanks Gillian. um karina considering this is your this is your second business karina is that right um oh can you hear me okay i'm just getting an internet unstable yeah yeah what yeah, yeah. what of manny there's been many over the years, yeah. This is the first like real startup, you know, the one where they say Enterprise Ireland are interested and it has high potential. The rest are just businesses, you know. <laughs> Very good. Well, congratulations. Queen, I'm just wondering, considering the experience that you have, how do you... You like I know from experience, I become very attached or I, I am very attached to the business. Um, it's almost like a baby to me. How... When you become so emotionally attached to the business that you run, it can be difficult sometimes to allow others to make decisions, especially if you don't necessarily agree with them. Considering your experience and the success that you currently have with Content Lama, how do you become more comfortable allowing others to make decisions or to take control within cer in certain areas within the business? Um, probably because you have to. Um, is the first reason. So it's a, it's it's very different to any other businesses I have I've had, where you, everything is bigger, everything it grows faster, everything has to be done at a bigger scale, and for that to happen, other people have to do the work for you. But uh, when I was on my New Frontiers program, I spent every drive listening to podcasts, and one of them was um, "How I Built This" by Guy Raz. And one of the tips that I heard, I think it was on that or else on the LinkedIn guys one, and it was don't hire somebody that you wouldn't work for. So with the, my co-founders that have come on board and with anyone that we've hired since, I always kind of ask myself that question, would I take instruction from them? And um, we've made one mistake, but we hired slow and kind of gently pushed them out fast. And the rest are people that um, if they make a mistake, well, in my view, a mistake, but if, if something didn't go as planned, I would be able to say that the same could have happened to me. So we've surrounded, there is only, there's three co-founders, there's two software people, and now there's two operational people. But any of them in the team now, if something, if they made a decision and it didn't go as we would have liked it to go, I would definitely say that 
the same could have happened to me. So I think it's about surrounding yourself with people that you think are at least as good as you um, and preferably better than you at some things. And if you can get that, then it's, it's much easier to let go because I am a little bit of a micromanager. So that is my Achilles heel. Did you make the same mistake that I made? I, I made the mistake um, at the beginning of hiring people that were very like me, that, you know, people that I, personality-wise, I, I felt I could get on with. Um, and that wasn't always the right decision. I'm lucky now because I have a co-founder, Jolene, and while similar, we're very different. So we have that balance because I would be like you. I would fall into that. Oh, we get on great. And just yeah. because they're like you doesn't mean that they're going to be uh, really, really good at their job. So uh, we've yeah. just been lucky so far. Uh, and that one person that wasn't a fit, it wasn't their fault. You know, they were lovely people. But we very quickly realized they weren't a fit and we, we let them go very, very quickly. Because that was yeah. the thing I learned from all the podcasts. You know, if it's not right, move them on swiftly. It's, yeah, it's very difficult though, isn't it? Um, you know, it's a very brave thing to do if you can, if you can do it quickly. Yeah. No, do you know what? I didn't find it difficult this time. In all my other businesses, I would have. But as Gillian said, this isn't my business now. So um, it's not my choice. It's not whether I want it or whether I like them. I have other people that we have to report to. So when you go into that acting mode to say, well, it's for the business, it's not me, you know, then it's much easier to, to do it. And that's kind of the mind that you have to be in. Yeah, yeah. And on that topic, just in terms of, of being a success in business and growing successful business, what do you think are the most important characteristics that we all should try to develop as founders? Listening, uh, learning. And uh, I'm not, you know, I, I love studying, but we don't have time. So podcasts are my thing um, and just staying upbeat. And I find if it was one tip I'd give, um, it's to listen to good business success stories because I actually really do believe that if you can imagine it then it's going it will happen for you um so instead of listening to the radio going down the road put on um some of the really good business podcasts that are telling entrepreneurial success stories and the more I listen to them the more I learned little tidbits that go in you know storytelling and the more I realized that they were all just like me you know um when, when we started out it's hard to imagine how I could have a not, not being a software developer, how could I have a software company being from Roscommon and living in Donegal that would sell a product into the States? But when you listen to all these stories and they're just random people like us that have just gone, oh, yeah, here I am now. Um, so it's be open to opportunity, um, learn, listen to what people are telling you about your product because if you have a bad reaction to what you're te they're telling you, there's a problem. Um, it's either you know with the product or with you because you should be able to take everything on board and say well what did they tell me that I could use uh, and those would be the main things to stay positive uh, don't listen to the news and um, we don't have to and um, as I suppose I would add as well you know none of it is personal is it I mean it's all it is business so you know if you do get any negative feedback or constructive feedback or suggestions for improvements it is it is all coming from a good place and it isn't personal it's not and some of the most random stuff people have said to me I've come back to it you know you might say oh that but that's not my business and that's not you know and but well, they don't really know when you don't say that to them. You just say, oh, that's amazing. Thanks for your advice. And you'd be surprised the amount of times where you'll loop back two months later. I'm always doing this to my co-founder. She'd be like, oh, hey, you know, we should do this. And I'd be like, no, no, no. And then, you know, two months later, I'm like, Jolene, remember that thing you were saying, you know? So it's to be open that you, um, I would always say our product is not our product. It's actually an amalgamation of the, all the ideas of the people that we met on New Frontiers, of our customers, of our investors, of our co-founders. There's probably like 10% or less that's actually me who started the whole thing. Um, so it's just to take it on board. And even if it, you just think they haven't a clue what they're talking about, I guarantee you, you'll go back onto their comments at some point and go, all right, okay. Because they're just looking at it from a different point of view. So don't take it personally um, very few people will tell you your product is rubbish no no they wouldn't no they wouldn't i think what people tend to do is give you their opinion and their take on on some small aspect of it yeah. and you're right 
we may think, oh, well, you know, they don't know the process or they don't know what I've gone through or they don't know, um, you know, how it works. Or but the they don't know the market. They don't, they don't know, know the market. market. They don't yeah, know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they're coming from such a good place and they're, they're, they've got a very unique view as well. Um, and they're usually right, you know, they're usually right in some way. Um, and you're right, we do store all that information up and then it, it comes back to us in the future, especially maybe if two or three people say the same thing, you know. Um, okay, I think that's all the questions I have. Um, I think I had a couple actually, um, and it's just, I suppose when we were talking about growth, Larissa, you know, we often get caught up in the shiny parts of it. So for me, like, I hate raising money. It just, I, I, the whole process of it drives me bananas. I'd far rather be doing the product and driving forward and customers and that type of thing. And it's really easy to get caught up on the shiny bit of the business. But when we're going for growth, what do you think are the things that we don't actually give enough consideration to that we should spend a bit more time on really, really looking at that you would rather leave them under the rock, if you know what I mean? So I think actually um, it's what you focus, it was what you mentioned earlier on, Gillian, and that was the laser sharp focus. So and both you and Karina do this very well in your businesses. You know exactly who your customer is, exactly what the problem is that you're trying to serve. And you're not trying to solve all the problems in your industry at the one time. And this is something that I have to go back to all, all of the time because as accountants, we could do accounts for every business. You know, the accounts are accounts, it's debits and credits and, and tax, but we can't. So we focus on our market. We know who our customer is, who our ideal customer is, and we design a product or service that hopefully meets their needs. Um, and we always have to constantly remind ourselves what that problem is that we're trying to solve and who our customer actually is and not get distracted by the shiny new thing. Yeah, it's so easy to do though, isn't it? Like somebody says, you know, we even find, um, and Karina, I'm sure you've been through this, somebody will say something to you and the tech could be adapted for this and you're kind of sitting there going, cut it. But you actually really, really need to pick up the phone and have 10 conversations with somebody and say, would you buy this if I spent time doing it? And then te ring 10 people you've never met in your life. Have you had to go back to the drawing board, Karina, a couple of times? Like, I know I have myself with our product in particular. Yes, um, COVID. <laughs> I know it's changed everyone's lives. I actually don't know if we'd have a business only for COVID because um, we, in March, when we were going live with our product and we're about to sign our first contracts, we were going to be sending content into e-commerce teams in retailers. Um, and what we realized with COVID was there was going to be no e-commerce teams on the other end. And we started serving SMEs and we knew that if whatever we sent them, even if it wasn't fully ready to go live, they were just going to put up anyway. So it was going to look really bad from our end. So we ended up realizing that we were going to need a product that would actually give them web ready Content. I know this sounds like, well, why, you know, and you know, somebody did say that to me to over 12 months ago. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> but actually now we're doing web ready content. So we've had to change our whole software product into being something that we might let an e-commerce team interact with in some way to just being like this floaty thing in the background of their lives that they never see. And the content magically appears. Um, and that slight change has meant other clients have come back to ask for that product that, you know, six months ago we wouldn't, we weren't even thinking of doing. But it's really difficult to, it's nice when you get it right like that. You know, we, we made the change and then we had a previous potential customer come back and ask for exactly that. And we're like, okay, yes, we're on to something here. But it's really difficult to have that balance between when you make that change, like you said, Gillian, is it the right one, you know? Are you going to ruin your whole business and burn all your cash and um a lot of it i think is just like you said talking to people and asking them would you pay for it would you buy it and how do you manage that like so i would say without the navy seals how to sleep in less than two minutes it mm -hmm. saved my life over the last couple of years i can sleep anywhere and within two minutes um 
that to me, because I think everything's possible on a night's sleep, right? But there is some nights where when everything's buzzing around in your head and it's a dark, lonely place to be. How do you manage it when it all gets a bit overwhelming? Um, I am a 5 am -er, which means that I get up at 10 to 5. And that makes it manageable for me because nobody, well, there's very few. There are some other women entrepreneurs that I'm friendly with um, since New Frontiers and Acorns that do it with me. But it means that no matter what happens today, like stuff has happened today that I will be thinking about tonight. But I know that I'm going to be up at 5 a.m. So I've got like two and a half to three hours before the kids get up. And there's nobody else working and there's no customers emailing me where I can solve the problem. And I can actually think through it quietly. And only for that, yeah, it's been years since I would go to bed thinking about a problem because I know I don't have to. I'll be up at five in a quiet kitchen with loads of coffee, no emails, no customers, no kids, no nothing. And I've got two hours at least to think the problem through or sort it. So that means you're not, you know, the way you always go to bed and you're like, oh, I've this to do and that to do and this to do. I have to get that to somebody else. And I didn't get to that today and they're expecting it tomorrow. It's amazing. And I made that decision, I think. I was a 6 a.m. -er, and then one of the girls on the Acorn group said, oh, I used to be on this 5 a.m. club because we used to get the train to Dublin. So I was like, okay, let's do 5 a.m. Um, um, it was hard in the beginning, but now we do it and we still check in with each other. Um, and that is the magic time, which means you can go to bed and be like, oh, I do it at 5 a.m. So that's how I cope. Not for everybody. I'm not a night owl, so, but that's how I would do it, yeah. Brilliant. I'm just looking at the time. Mary, did you want to jump in? Love to. Thank you. That was absolutely amazing. There is just so many nuggets of gold in all the things that you said. So I used to be a member of the 6am club when I had a startup as well, Karina. And then there was one day when I sat down and said to myself, I actually don't have enough hours in the day. So something's got to give here. And then that was the day that I switched to being a 5 a.m. member. Yay. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, it is sometimes a crazy thing. So, I mean, some of the stuff I've written down here that I absolutely loved, you're always running out of money. Second time around, I was just ruthless. And then that whole trick about managing your investors once you have them on board, this is a really key part of the journey, ladies and a couple of gents that we have on here, but actually managing, managing your investors and getting the most out of them after you've worked so hard to bring them in is a really important part of it. So I, my job this evening is to, um, is to pose to our panel this evening some of the questions that you guys put up when you were filling out your event rights. So I've selected some of them. Uh, if we don't get to them all, what we're planning on doing is on the Awaken Hub website, we'll pop some questions and answers up as part of a blog this week. Uh, and before we start, I'm just going to give a question to Gillian that came in from our friends from Rays in Belfast that are on the call this, this evening. And the question, Gillian, is how many angels did you talk to before you got some interest? Um, so different stages. Uh, at the beginning, I the first time... Mean at the beginning, yeah. Yeah, at the very beginning, probably about 10 individuals that I met outside the HBAN um, and they were recommended to us by other people. Um, one of them uh, was phenomenal and then the others just decided not to invest um, and that's when I ended up in the HBAN pitching and it was so much easier because with the HBAN they actually give you an investor manager so one of the angels that's interested then manages everybody's questions so you only have one person to be dealing with um, and so it does save a huge amount of time. Uh, that's a great point for anybody that hasn't raised investment who's on the call they might not realize that but yes there is you don't have to deal with all those people in a syndicate you just deal with one lead investor who does everything on behalf of everyone else. Um, there's another related question here that somebody posed that might just be a real quick one for you as well, Gillian, which is, did you know your investors personally prior to investment? Not at all. Um, I tend, I didn't know that the word high net worth individual existed before I started a startup. So um, just to put that in context, no, didn't, okay. uh, didn't know any of them. And 
This question is for all of you, so we're just going to go around all of you quickly and start with you, please, uh, Larissa. Um, and it's from Maria, who's on the call this evening, and great to see you, Maria. Um, how key have your networks been in playing a role in developing your business? So we'll go Larissa, Karina, Gillian. Oh, and my network has been the reason, I suppose, the company has developed and, and grown the way it has done right from the early stages with Leo and um, and meeting everybody there and, and getting the advice of, of of the people in Leo to, you know, over to going for growth and continuing the momentum, Enterprise Ireland and all of the natural networks, I suppose, built um, around those organisations and the women and men that I've met as a result of being involved in those organisations have been the reason why the company has grown um, and why I, as, as an individual, have grow, has grown. Um, um, and been able to, um, I suppose, grow the company and scale the company to the, to the level that it's currently at. Karina? Uh, I struggled with networking and networks, and it's a term that I, I really dislike. I love to chat, but uh, when I started this journey, and everyone was like, oh, you have to have a network, and I was like, well, I don't have a network. I do have a network now, but it's something that happened incrementally over two years, and it's been everything that's happened, new customers, uh, funding, um, everything has been a result of my network. But when I was told that two or three years ago on New Frontiers and I didn't have a network, I was like, oh, how do I get that? And you're supposed to go to events and meet people. So I would say to somebody who thinks that maybe they don't have a strong network is start with one, you know, and if, as you meet one person you meet another person and it does build and you will look back then, like I can definitely say I have a network now and it's helped my business in sales, um, in fundraising, um, everything. But don't be afraid if you don't have a network now. Just start with one person in this group. Um, if you start with one person in this group this week, and then eventually over the next few months, just you know, ask people for 10 minutes just for a bit of advice um, on your business. People like Gillian was very kind to me. People that are a bit ahead of you will always give you 10 minutes because other people did it for them. And that's just what you do and your network will build without you knowing it. And then in, in, in 12 months time, you'll be like, oh, I do have a network. But the thought of going into you know, a room to network freaks me out. I'm grand when I'm in there, but I might just talk to the one person I like as opposed to you know, this work the room and make acquaintances and do all that, yeah. Yeah, Gillian? I um, completely agree with Larissa and Karina. I am an introvert, so everything you see is learned. Um, all this chat is completely learned um, behaviors. Just to, to a, another point, um, and what the girls have said is absolutely so correct, and building your network is incredible. You need it for your team. I would say, like, in your network, really look who do I want to know and go and find out how you're going to get to know them. So it's kind of a little bit stalkerish in one way, but actually look through how's the connections that you need to find to be able to talk to those people. Because for me, like, I don't know how to build a global empire, right? But whatever the challenge is in my business, who's going to be the person that could actually give me advice about it? And that's why your network is so important because otherwise you're paying consultants for it. Yeah. Whereas the advice is there and it is free. Um, so use, yeah, definitely build and use your network. Okay, stay on with me, Gillian, because I think this question's probably, I'll start with you for this one. It's one that Perry, who's on the call this evening, has asked. Um, there's kind of two bits to this. The first bit is, and I think you have covered this well earlier, is in how do you, ch how do you change that casual conversation into a will you invest in my business conversation? Mm. And the second part that Perry has asked about, and again, I don't think that this is anything that any of you can answer in any sort of specifics because there isn't a specific answer to this, but can you talk through what sort of percentages of equity you would expect people to give away at the, at the different stages when they're taking on more and more funding? So can we start with you, Gillian, then go to Larissa, and then go to Karina on those, on those two questions, please? Yeah, um, so the first one is really, really simple. Do you have a term sheet or would you like me to give you a term sheet? That's how you ask, <laughs> are they investing or not? And as I said, very nice and pandry the first time and it cost me a fortune in coffee, a bit more ruthless because you don't want tire kickers 
and you're wasting their time as well. So real simple. Do you want a term sheet? Do you want to give me a term sheet or do I have one? And then in equity, equity is always down to valuation um, when you're in the kind of seed raise. If you think about it, Enterprise Ireland, if you get CSF, has valued your company a half a million. So 50,000 investment, 10% of the company. You need then, as you're looking along, to go with it. So can there's lots of VC in, um, metrics and they are all to do with revenue. You don't have revenue when you're raising seed money. So can you argue that on top of an Enterprise Ireland's valuation that you've added value to the order of two or three times that in your business? So that's 50, like if it's 1.5 million, if it's 2 million. So anywhere between 500,000 and usually 2.5 in Ireland, I'm talking about the US is totally different in terms of valuations to me is a seed round um, raise. So your equity is worked out based on your valuation. And, you know, if you have good traction, if you have strong potential sales pipeline, the product is in good enough shape, but you're just getting there, you really shouldn't be valuing yourself too low. Um, but don't get caught up in how much equity you're giving away. Um, it's not as an important thing. Small percentages are not as important as some of the terms that the that might be in the term sheet that will catch you further down the line. So you do need to plan what does that look like before I go into my next raise of money. Larissa? The first question, I can't really add anything more than what Gillian has said. I think that's just... Um that's just like so straight just be straight about it and ask the question um and anything else you're just you're just wasting time potentially the valuation is a really interesting question um and we get asked this a lot um how do i value my company you know what's it worth it's like extraordinarily difficult to put a valuation on any company pre-revenue startup or even you know scaled company it's an, a, apart from it being a public listed company if it's a private company it's practically impossible to value there's different metrics, as Gillian said, revenue, you know, percentage of profit, balance sheet, totals, et cetera. But essentially it's about um, having a conversation with your investors, knowing yourself, talking to others. Um, if you have obviously investment from EI, that helps. If you don't, it's even more difficult. Um, and ultimately, the only advice I would give would be not to not to value the company too low. I think that's a lot what a lot of us tend to do at the beginning. Um, we need the money, so we value the company lower than we should. So talk to others who have been through the journey to try not to make that mistake. Rena, anything to add? Um, no, I've written down Gillian's one, which is great, because I'm big on uh, sales and making sure that you know what... We have lots more questions, so we'll just generalize. keep going here, shall yeah. we? So I'll start you off maybe with the uh, one that... Um, with a question that uh, Lo uh, Laura has put up. How do I find the best investors for my company? Is it a matter of comparing to other companies that they have invested in? For us on the angel investor side, it was our gut. Um, so we spoke to a number of angel investors and the first ones we spoke to would be very well known. And we were like, oh, this is it, you know, but actually, they weren't speaking our language and we didn't feel great talking to them. So we ended up um, just kind of gently removing them from the equation by not adjusting our valuation and giving the, the angel investors that we were interested in a lot better valuation. So, you know, just because they're going to give you money, especially on the angel side, like Gillian said, you, you know, can you foster a relationship with them and work with them? Um, on the on the VC side, I don't have any experience on, on that side of things as much. Anybody care to add anything more on that about how to find the right sort of investors? Big thing for me would be look at your team. Where are the holes and investors that can fill those holes for you while you're building out your team? And do they have the type of black book that can bring you into the market? So can they be part of your go to market strategy? And do they have the experience of actually scaling and growing a company from, from an infancy, especially at the beginning? Um, but to me, it's the weaknesses in your own team. You should be looking to get investors that can prop that up for you, if possible. Um, and I have a question here that sort of relates back to the networking angle. Um, it's a sort of interesting twist on it. It's from Michelle Cheng, who's on the call here this evening. 
So Michelle asks, has it got to be warm intros? Have any of you had any success success with cold intros? And if so, what made it successful? I don't know who wants to take that one first, but. Um, I'll take it. Um, yeah, I've had success with cold intros. Um, LinkedIn is fantastic. Um, COVID was a really good opportunity actually um, to reach out to people because, well, I just thought that people might be sitting at home and might have more time that they would normally be spending traveling. And I reached out and, and you know, introduced myself and arranged calls. Um, and they were very successful in terms of building my network. So absolutely, cold introductions. Karina? Um, both, yeah. I have no problem using LinkedIn and um I am a people person, so if I can meet them at a trade show and face to face, I'll definitely do that. But yeah, cold intros, or you know, if you meet somebody casually, just to follow up with a phone call, or you know, don't let it just be that. It doesn't always have to be warm intros, especially if it's a sector that they're interested in. You know, if they're if they're very experienced, they either have time to help you and want to, or they don't. And it's not to take offence if they don't have time or it's not a fit. Um, because in three years' time, it might they might have time and it'd be a fit. So just to keep trying and you know build it up that way. Julian, mm. anything? Yeah, sure. Like just to keep it on the funding side of things. Um, like cold intros to VCs. Somebody's job is to find you, so make their job easy by reaching out and being and it's cold. Like that is that what's what that their job is. So don't be afraid of looking and emailing them going hi my name is and we're thinking of raising um yeah absolutely own it and yeah ours was both warm and cold if you can get a warm all the better um but i wouldn't let it stop you that's what a vc's job is yeah so i would add to that that if you're going to do the cold approaches to the vc yeah by all means reach out and say that you're raising keep it brief but be very clear as well you know, don't send those rambling, hi, I'm so-and-so, it would be great to have a coffee with you, blah, blah, blah. They're just going to delete it. You know, go with purpose, and that way you might, you know, you might have a chance. But a warm intro, I think, is always better. Okay, last question of the evening. So keep it short, please, everyone. Um, and then I pass back to Sinead for us to wrap up here. Uh I thought that this was a kind of cool question to finish on. So uh, thanks, Anne-Marie, if you're on the call here for, for posting this one up. At what point did you know it was time to seek investment? And can we go Karina, Larissa, and then finally with Gillian on that? So when did you know? <laughs> um, we did NDRC, which is the accelerator. And part of that is to set you up for investment. So I have to say we were kind of guided into that. You know, would I have known before that? I might have dragged it on much longer, but it was being on an accelerator like that that kind of sets you up for it, that it's the next stage. And would you recommend NDRC as a process for people that are on this call that are a bit earlier than you, Karina? Yes. Uh, even though they take 10% for the 50,000, because that's something that a lot of women ask me about, whether or not it's worth it. Yeah, I never, um, I'm not precious about my percentages, to be honest, because I think that, uh, you know, what you can look back and oh, did we get 10%? But it's part of, I saw it as part of the journey. So 10% on the NDRC program was worth it for me. It might be different for other people, but it was what we needed at the time. Thank you. Larissa? My journey has been quite different. I can't say that I ever reached a point where I knew that I needed to raise money. Um, a service business is, is different in that regard. You know, you you will, you will, you are able to have a business. I suppose it just depends on the level of growth you want. I knew that I would grow the company. I just knew that taking money on board, I would get there quicker. Mm -hmm. um, but I would still get there regardless of whether the money came on board. What the money did was it accelerated that growth and allowed, allowed me to grow a lot quicker than I would have done otherwise. Uh, mm -hmm. We knew from the beginning that we would need it. Um, myself and Ken's, all our savings from whatever went into the first couple of years of getting it up off the ground and getting that proof of principle and the early metrics um, established 
to get us to a point in investment. Um, how do you know yourself that you need it? Basically, you can't replicate yourself and so you can't actually do everything after a certain amount of time. My next business is going to be a cloning business. Um, but for the moment, you know, you really do need resource. And like I'm technical, but I can't build an enterprise sales product. I can't build all the testing procedures. And you know you need resource. Um, and to be able to get it, as Larissa says, quicker down the line and what that jump is. And I completely agree with Karina. We grew up on every accelerator we ever did. So it's not just about giving away the equity, it's the experience, the network, and where it brings you next. So equity from an accelerator comes with a package and you need to think about the value of the package, not just the cash and the equity trade. Okay, well that has been absolutely amazing uh we will share the videos and everything else around and i'm now going to go and pass back to sinead who's going to wrap us up for this evening but before i do thank you ever so much for the three of you that was fabulous thank you yeah, thanks mary thanks uh, thank you ladies that was really super informative i think we could have probably gone on for another hour no problem but i think it's better to quit while we're ahead and everybody's minds and hearts and souls are full of, of, of good news and, and good things to follow up on. So thank you all, everybody. We've run one minute over, which I think for Irish people, that's pretty damn good, really. Um, so have a fantastic evening. Thanks very much, everyone. Goodbye.